take a hymn. Let's turn to page 106. Praise him, praise him. First and last, choir comes down on the last. Praise him, praise him. crossing the aisles. Everybody's welcoming one another, all right? Everybody fellowship. Shake somebody's hand tonight. back in the Lord's house tonight, and we're also delighted that you're here. We welcome our visitors. We pray the Lord will minister to your heart through sermon and song. I told the men in the prayer room how we thank the Lord for the good liberty he gave us this morning to be able to preach and to be able to worship God together here in the church house, and we're just thankful for the privilege to be back tonight. I'm going to let them get their music ready, college and career uh, with the senior saints. Please remember the date, September the 28th, all right? College and career, everybody in that bracket, and the senior saints, all the senior saints, September 28th. There'll be a sign-up sheet soon, all right? This Tuesday, if you're interested, first volleyball game for the Mountain View Christian Academy. Young ladies starts at 5 p.m., all right? And uh, you'll enjoy that if you'd like to participate and watch, all right? This is a youth choir. They're probably going to do two. Let's say men and worship with them while they sing, all right? Struggling through my life and the choices I have made. Looking to the right and left, trying to find my way. Coming to a crossroad where I caught a glimpse of him. The Savior reaching out to me with hands that bore my sin. Well, no greater love was shown than on the cross at Calvary. I decided then and there the 
choice was clear to me that I take Jesus. I'll take Jesus. I'll take Jesus every time. He is Lord of me. And the world you see, there's no question in my mind. I'll take Jesus every time. If opportunity should rise up like the sun, shine so bright on all the promises, what I could become. Luring hands of compromise could offer wealth and fame, tempting me to turn around, denying Jesus' name. Well, I'd rather be a poor man and have riches in the truth so without a second thought let me tell you what i do i take jesus Hey. 
if we're not if we're not anything else, we ought to be amazed. Amen. I'm serious. We ought to be amazed that He'd take the time to save us, to hear our prayers, to be the dearest friend we've ever had. I, I am amazed, and I know you are as well. Thank you for youth choir. Thank you, adult choir. Immediately after the service tonight, we're going across the road to the uh, fellowship hall, and we're having a wedding shower for Brother Dallas and Miss Jenna Dover, uh, Dallas Kirby and Dennis, uh, Jenna Dover. And so uh, there's food over there. You're more than welcome to come to enjoy the fellowship, the food, and uh, eat with us and enjoy that time together. Keep that in mind. This Wednesday night, of course, we'll have church at 7. Keep that in mind, if you will. Uh, make a note of the fall revival, October 4th through the 6th, please. Please also tend to the online directory. It's up to you to do your part for the online directory. And uh, you just have to get online and do what you need to do to contribute and be a part of that. We appreciate it. Let's have the ushers come on in. We'll get the regular tithe and a regular offering. We encourage you tonight to give your regular tithes and your regular offering unto the Lord. God's been good to Mountain View Baptist Church. I mean that. We, we thank him. We praise him. Now listen to me. God's been good to us because God's people have been obedient to the Lord. Amen. That's why. God's people have been obedient to the Lord. And we want you to continue to be obedient in this matter of your tithes and offerings, all right? Tiffany's going to play for us, and I want Parker to come up here and sit with me, and he's going to pray for us in just a moment, all right? Go ahead. This is uh, Brother Parker Fallor, and uh, we may get him to preach Wednesday night. He's up here on vacation. Some of his other family's coming, and not his dad, I don't think. But this is the son of Brother Tim Fallor, who we have in our Jubilee every year and coming again this uh, upcoming year. But I just found out, Brother David, that uh, the lake house that, that they go to, uh, his, dad, his grandfather's a big bass fisherman. Got the boats, the rods. So he says to everybody that wants to come bass fish, come on over that's Lake Hartwell, all right? Pray for us, Brother Floor. Pray for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're certainly grateful for another opportunity to come into your house, worship you, Lord, hear from you. Lord, we're not worthy of this great honor. And Lord, I hope we never lose sight of that. Lord, the Amen. chance to commune and fellowship with the creator of the universe, Lord, the a thrice holy God, Lord, we're thankful for it. Lord, I'm thankful for this church, Lord, what it's meant to me, Lord, what it's meant to so many around the country, Lord, with everything that's going on. I'm thankful for what I've been hearing that you've been doing here, Lord. The, the spirit, Lord, the, the work that you've been doing, seeing your hand. Lord, as uh, Brother Jeff Griffith said, having a walkthrough just every now and again. And we're thankful for it. Lord, I pray that you bless this service, Lord. Help every song sung, every lyric mentioned, Lord, every, every word that comes from Brother Cooper's mouth to be ordained by you, to be honoring and glorifying to you, Lord. Lord, bless this offering. Bless the gift, but give the greater blessing to the giver. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. This is Miss Desiree Cooper, and they got together before service and got one ready to sing tonight. She sung out there in California, and we've asked her to sing here. Appreciate her getting in the youth choir with, with well, herself and a little boy. So uh, let's give her a good welcome. I don't mean clap, but let's worship with her while she sings. All right, Miss Desiree? <laughs> I'm 
tested many waters. I've sailed a lot of seas searching for one that would bring lasting peace. Those worldly new ways only brought a bitter flood, but I found what I needed when I saw the blood. failing to redeem you can have the new river i'll take that old stream today's modern thinkers do not want to hear about the shed blood of our savior so dear Shame to say it, yeah, the blood's the only way. And I'll take the old stream that flows from the mountain, sweet Calvary's fountain that makes sinners clean. Tried and tested, it's been faithful, never failed. Never failing to redeem. You can have the new river. I'll take that old stream. Yeah, good. Amen. You say amen to that? I don't think I've ever heard that. That's great. Appreciate the wonderful words, all right? Job, One more trio. We're going to turn the preacher loose. And uh, we're so thankful they joined this morning. What a blessing. And uh, we got others praying about it. And I'm telling you now, the man from Michigan is wanting to move down here. So y'all got to find him a house, okay? I'm talking about the mission director man. He wants to move here. So we've got to find him a house, all right? Right now we're going to want some rental. So find him one, okay? Let me know, all right? All right, good to have Dallas' family right here. Thank you for loaning your son. We love him. And you can't have him back. You can't have him back. There's no getting him back, all right? God bless you. He made in me because of the blood I'm forgiven and free. Everything changed the moment His mercy found me, found me. Now every sin has been traded for grace. Love came and washed away every stain. I'll testify. Over and over again, how lost I was, how saved I am. Well, maybe you're 
thinking that you're too far gone. You can't get to the cross from the road that you're on, but he'll find you right there. Trust me, I've been there. Oh, what a difference he made in me. Because of the blood, I'm forgiven and free. Everything changed the moment his mercy found me found me now every sin has been traded for grace love came and washed away every stain i'll testify over and over again how lost i was how saved i thinking that you're too far gone you can't get to the cross from the road that you're on but he'll find you right there <laughs> trust me i've been there oh what a difference he made in me because of the blood i'm forgiven and free everything changed the moment his mercy found me found me now every sin has been traded for grace love came and washed away every stain i'll testify over and over again how lost i was how saved i am i'm praising my savior story yeah this is my song oh what a difference he made in me because of the blood i'm forgiven and free everything changed the moment his mercy found me found me now every sin has been traded for grace love came and washed away every stain i'll testify over and over again over and over again how lost i was how saved i am this is my story this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. That's shouting ground. Amen. Praise the Lord. Great singing. All the singing all day long. We appreciate it. Thank the Lord for folks that's willing to use their talents. For the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's get our Bibles in our hand. It's an honor to have this preacher. You know, he joined this morning. He'll be launching out in September, going just about everywhere and preaching just, I mean, week after week, Sunday after Sunday. So I figured we better scoop him up while we can. Yeah, I'm going to sit right there. And, uh, and so we scooped him up again tonight, and we love him, and we'll give him undivided attention. All right? All right, preacher. Thank you, brother. All right, take your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter number 6, please, tonight. Matthew chapter number 6, it's been good to be in church on Sunday night. You know, you can't, you can't always say that and be truthful, but I'm glad we can say it. We don't have to lie one bit tonight. It has been good to be in church. And let me just plug this in a hurry. It's so important that we raise our families in a place like this. I promise you this, I promise you this, that the contemporary church down the road is not going to produce generational Christianity. I promise you that. That shallow Christianity, it's not going to produce children that follow God. I looked up there and saw those young people singing in the youth choir. You can't put a price on that. And the Bible said train up a child in the way he should go. And it's not old time religion, it is Bible Christianity. We're not, we're not, we're not promoting to you the 50s or the 60s. We're promoting to you what we think the Bible teaches. And it'll work, it'll work, and it will last, and it will stand. And in this day, and in this day where they're blurring gender lines, we don't need to blur worship lines. Everybody all right? And I'm not mad at anybody. I just enjoyed what we've done tonight. And 
like it says in the book of Psalms, I like it, I love it, I want some more of it. All right, so Matthew, I think it's there somewhere in the book of Psalms. Matthew chapter, <laughs> y'all listen to the wrong kind of music. Y'all, Matthew chapter number, <laughs> Matthew chapter number six. And I'm praying God will use the thought tonight to be, to be a blessing to you. And uh, Lord, forgive me. All right, here we go. Matthew chapter number six, verse number 24. I want you to see what the Bible says. No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body. What you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying... What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things should the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If you study out this section of scripture, there is a statement or at least a sentiment that is mentioned over and over again. And that statement or that sentiment is, take no thought. Don't worry about what might happen. Don't worry about what could happen. Don't get caught up in the hypothetical and miss what is going on today. Over and over and over, the Lord is telling this crowd before he sends them back out into the world, you don't have to be anxious. You don't have to be nervous. You don't have to be wrapped up in care. Take no thought. He said, if God takes care of the birds and if God can take care of the lilies and if God can clothe the fields, surely God can take care of you. Now, I would say it would be right for you and I to doubt that if God had ever failed. If you could pull me up an example of where God didn't come through on that promise, then maybe we'd have cause to lose sleep tonight, pace the floor, bite our nails, birth an ulcer, and say, woe is me. But since nobody can pull up an example where God didn't come through, I would reckon we ought to just follow what he says here and not worry. I want to hit on what I think is probably the most prevalent sin in Christianity. And it's not gossip, though that'd be good to hit on. That's the only time gossips get quiet is when you preach on it. It's not alcohol or liquor. I think probably the most prevalent sin, and it's just as much of a sin as the others, is worry. Faith tells me God is bigger than my problem. Worry tells me my problem is bigger than my God. Now, God is for planning and God is for preparing, but God is not for worrying. I heard about a man, he was always nervous, worried about everything, and he couldn't ever get anything done because he was so worried with life. And a man looked at him and said, Ralph, good night. He said, you got two hands, why don't you do something with them? He said, I am, I'm wringing them both right now. And I'm afraid that's where a lot of Christians live. For a little while this evening, I'm going to preach on this slide. Just a reminder, God is real good at being God. He doesn't need my help and he doesn't need your help. God is real good. That being God, let's pray. God, I pray for your help and power to preach. I pray for liberty. Encourage your people. Help us with this truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Worry is something that we all have in common. And it's something that we all battle against constantly. In life, we encounter things we did not expect. We experience things that we did not plan. We endure things that we don't understand. Worry affects the intellect and it affects the emotion. It touches our thought life, and it touches our feelings. The Bible tells us to be anxious for nothing. But truthfully, isn't it that we are often anxious about everything? 
Lester Olaf used to sing the song, Living by Faith. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, though sunshine or shadow or rain. My Lord, I know rule over everything, and all of my worry is vain. I'm living by faith. But the truth of it is, more often than not, we live anxiously and not by faith. That word anxious means to strangle. It means to tighten. It means to just go ahead and suffocate the life out of something. You study worry. Worry touches the heart rate. Worry messes up your sleep pattern. Worry will take away your rational thinking. When you worry, you don't panic. Or you, rather, you don't pray, you panic. When you worry, you don't have assurance, you have anxiety. When you worry, you not worship God. Think about it tonight. Worry does not take one ounce of salvation. What I mean by that is you don't have to be saved to worry. The lost man can worry just as well as the saved man can worry. Worry is unholy, worry is unreasonable, and worry is unnecessary. Worry is the offspring of unbelief. You study your Bible, faith had Peter walking on the water. But just one second of worry had him sinking beneath the waves. Worry tonight is the enemy of joy. It is the silencer of faith. It breeds fear, brings doubt, and makes you lean on the flesh. Worry does not fix anything. Worry does not alleviate anything. And worry has never offered a solution. I want you to consider tonight, can you tell me a time when worry ever helped you? Can you tell Tell me a moment when it ever brought comfort to your soul. Can you remember a time when it brought peace into your life? Can you tell me a moment when worry brought you victory? Here's what I know. When I worry, it does not bring out of control things back under my control. When I worry, it does not make the hard situation any easier. When I worry, it does not make the heavy load any lighter. Lighter worry is a liar. Worry is a thief. Worry is a taskmaster and it puts you in bondage. Worriers are shadow boxers. Worriers are ghost chasers. They're living in a fictitious future in a haunting hypothetical. They lament what has not yet happened and they die over what might not ever take place. When you worry, you'll find yourself pacing the floor. You'll find yourself biting your nails to the quip. You'll find yourself bitter and suspicious and living with a victim mentality. Folks who worry are trapped to Today by thoughts of tomorrow. And I want to go on record and say that worrying time is a wasted time. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You can't take me to a moment. You can't show me the place. You can't take me to a text where God swung and missed, where God showed up at a time, where God didn't make the ends meet, where God didn't come through. And I want to remind you, whatever it is that's worrying you, it's not worrying him. It might might be rough on your side, but everything's well on heaven's side. God has never trembled on his throne. God has never lost sleep in the night. God has never called in back up or asked for a redo. God doesn't need a mulligan or a second chance. He does all things well. And tonight I want you to know what's bigger than you is not beyond him. And what's greater than you is not greater than him. And it's all under control in our Father's house. Worry will segregate. Worry will isolate. Worry will incapacitate. It makes you suspicious of folks that you used to love. It makes you vindictive and bitter. It'll damage your relationships, destroy your resolve, and derail your life's routine. It affects everything. Worry affects your family. Worry affects your job. Worry will affect your church, and it affects your spirit. Worry is a heavy late. Wait, it's a depressing, a pressing dilemma and a serious sin. I thought about worry. Here's what it does. Worry extracts interest on the trouble before the date is due. It drains you. It distorts you. It consumes you. It cripples you. And it will conquer you. Here's what worry does. It brings clouds into the sunshine of your life. It makes little things cast a big shadow. Worry has you chasing when you ought to be seeking. It has you scheming when you ought to be praying. It has you scrambling when you ought to wait on God. Worry is so stout as 
to question God's sovereignty. It has the audacity to question his omnipotence. It throws doubt on his omniscience. Worry will hide behind a smile. Worry will hide behind a shout. Worry will hide behind a suit. Worry will hide behind a skirt. Worry will hide behind the song. It'll hide behind the service. You might be sitting here tonight and it looks all together on the outside, but it feels like it's falling apart on the inside. We worry about our family. We worry about our finances. We worry about our future. We worry about our health. We worry about our home. We worry about our happiness. We worry every day. We worry every week. We worry every month and worry throughout the year. It seems like in the good times, we worry about the bad times. In the bad times, we worry that it might get worse. Worry. Oh, I'll tell you tonight, worry is a dangerous thing. Often in worry, you abandon your principle. In worry, you'll yield to your flesh. In worry, you'll hurt people that you love so much. In worry, you lose stability and you live reactionary. I read the story about a man in an orchestra and he was nervous because he couldn't play an E flat on his instrument. He couldn't get any sleep at night. He couldn't hit the E flat. He'd practice and practice and couldn't hit the E flat. He thought, I'll get kicked out of the orchestra. I don't know what I'm going to do. There's no way I can hit that note. I can't hit the E flat. And the conductor came to him and said, son, I can tell you've been upset about something. He said, what is it that's on your heart? He said, I'm just nervous. I'm worried. I can't hit the E flat. And the conductor said, son, there is no E flat in this symphony. Can I say a lot of things you and I waste time over, a lot of things that keep us up at night, a lot of things that arrest our attention and trouble our heart, they never even come to pass. And if they do, has not God handled it all anyway? Can I say worry will rob you of your faith and rob God from his place upon the throne? Worry seeks to rewrite the Bible and say, in the beginning, worry. It says in worry, dying for our sin. Can I say, that's not what my Bible says. It says in the beginning, God. It tells me he rules and reigns tonight. You go ahead and talk to Adam. There's no reason to worry. God's got it covered. You can talk to Noah. You don't need to worry. God's got it covered. You can talk to Abraham. You don't need to worry. God's got you covered. You can talk to Joseph. Don't you worry. God's got you covered. You can talk to David. Don't worry, David. God's got you covered. You can talk to Elijah. Don't you worry. God's got it covered. You can talk to Isaiah. Hey, it's all right. God's got you covered. You can talk to Jeremiah in the mire. It's all right. God's got you covered. You can step into a furnace and find, hey, God's got you covered. You can go with Daniel. They invited Daniel to a dinner party and God turned it into a sleepover. Hey, can I say God's got you covered? And tonight, child of God, he's still on the throne and he's still in business and he's still in the business of taking care of his children. He said, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. I promise you this tonight. Whenever we go home tonight, I promise you Lincoln is not going to lose sleep. I promise you little Lincoln is not going to go home and say, how are we going to pay the bills? How am I going to put food on the table? I don't know what I'm going to wear to school tomorrow. I don't know how I'm going to get gas in the car. I don't know how we're going to work. The, he's not going to do that. He's going to go home, eat a snack, take a bath, and go to bed and sleep like a baby. You say, why is that? Because none of that is his business. His business is to eat the food his father provides and to wear the clothes his father provides and to sleep in the bed his father provides and to live by the hand his father stretches out. And tonight it is not your job and it is not my job to worry about the details of life. My job is to have faith in God and to lean on God and trust in God and let God put the food on the table and the clothes on my back and the money in the bank. God is real good at being God. Oh, he's good at it. Hallelujah. Tell me a time he's not been faithful. Tell me a moment his mercies aren't new. I've seen a lot of things, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He's always come through in the midnight hour, in the nick of time, every time right on time. God makes it work. Don't you worry. God's good at being God. Oh, he's real good at being God. Well, we got to go eat. And celebrate, brother. Dallas is going to get married. God's in the miracle working business. So we want to go do that. So let's get to the text here. Matthew chapter 6 is the central chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. From chapter 5 to chapter 7, Jesus delivers kingdom principles. 
But within those, there's some practical truths that we can apply to the Christian life. I read this and I see heavenly wisdom paired with heavenly warning. He talks in chapter 6 about giving. He talks about praying. He talks about forgiving. And he talks about fasting. But as we come to the text that we read tonight, he begins to lay out a plan for prioritizing our life. Now tonight, listen to me, the Christian life is a life to be lived by divine order and orchestration. I don't live my life without any direction. I live my life according to the Word of God. And tonight you need to be reminded, hey, that worry is the enemy of order and order is the antidote to worry. In giving us this plan, he gives us the antidote. Now here's the context. They've been up on this mountain now for a while. Christ is about to send these people back out into the world. He can tell as he reads the crowd, these folks are anxious, these folks are a little bit nervous, these folks are wondering how they're going to navigate life in this world. He said, so let me give you some things to consider as you go back from the mountain and down into the valley. I want you to notice first, there's some opposing forces at work in this world. Look at verse number 24. No man can serve two masters. For either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve, and here's the root of most problems with worry. You cannot serve God and mammon. Verse 29, he says, he said, again, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon, well, that's the wrong verse. In the ESV, it's, I'm just kidding. Here's what it is. He said, you cannot serve, now watch, you study your Bible. Two kingdoms, right? There's earth, there's heaven, there's God, there's mammon, there's spirit, there's flesh. There's two masters, there's two natures, there's two kingdoms, and there's two forces. And the lost world is driven by the mammon. And he said, here's the trouble. Most Christians get wrapped up in worry when they get wrapped up in things that are temporal. When you get consumed and you get wrapped up in things that are dying or things that have an expiration date or things that won't matter in a million years around the throne, you're going to find yourself wrapped up in worry. Isn't that true that most of the stuff we worry about is stuff that has an expiration date on it? We worry about our home, our house, the keeping up of the house. We worry about this physical body that's dying every day. We worry about our job and worry about different things. Like that. That's where worry steps in. So there's these opposing forces. Let's go quickly. Then he said there's this obvious futility in that. Look at verse 25. Therefore I say you take no thought for your life. Now wait a minute. Our life is the most important thing we got. And yet Jesus said don't even think about it. He said what you shall, now watch where he says, eat what you shall drink nor yet for your body what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. In verse 27 he adds and says which of you by taking thought can add one cubit Unto his stature. So you see what he's talking about. He said, folks are chasing three things. Cash, clothes, and comfort. He said, and these folks are chasing these kind of, they're, they're looking for something to put in their belly, something to put on their back, and, and something to put in their bank. He said, that's what folks want. They want something, they want cash, they want clothes, and they want comfort. And the reason their marriage falls apart is because they're starting to chase after stuff that God would give them if they put him first. He said, the reason that they're struggling in their prayer life is they're too focused on putting something on their back instead of bending the knee and talking to God. He said, they're looking for these things like food and rain. They're looking for something they can satisfy their flesh with, and it drives them crazy. Because here's what I found out. When I get a new car, it's not long before the new car is an old car, and I want another new car. When I get a new suit, it's not long before it becomes the old suit, and I need another new suit. When I, when I have a friendship, it satisfies for a while, and then I want even more friends. Isn't that how it is? And we can't satisfy our flesh. And it's, it's just a futile thing. He said, you can get the fanciest car, live in the biggest house, have more zeros after your bank account uh, than anybody in this world. He said, but I tell you this, you'll still be wrapped up in worry because you got to keep those things going. So there's a futility to it. And he tries to calm them. I said, but here's some observable facts for you to consider. I like this in verse 26. Look at it. Behold the fowl. He said, now watch me. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. 
are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory said, wasn't arrayed like these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you. Now here's what's happening. They're leaving the mountain, going back to the valley, and maybe as they walk together on that mountainside, Jesus looks around and they, man, these folks are worried. Man, they're wondering, how am I going to pay the bill? What are we going to have for dinner? My kid's gone crazy. How am I going to get them back? My marriage is rocky. How am I going to fix it? He said, I got to give them something they can put in their pocket and take to the house with them. And about that time, about that time a little sparrow came flying off in the distance, and that little sparrow lighted on a branch, and not too long, the little bug came crawling on the ground and that sparrow swooped down, ate that bug off the ground, filled its belly, flew back up into a branch, found the nest and went to sleep. He said, you see that right there? He said, that sparrow doesn't even know there's a God in heaven. That sparrow's never been born again. That sparrow's never lifted holy hands. That sparrow's never praised his name. Yet there's never been a day he didn't have a branch to sit on. There's never been a moment he didn't have a voice to sing with. There's never been a meal. He was me away provided. Every night he's got a nest to sleep in. He said, don't you think if God can take care of a little bird like that, maybe God can take care of you. I know you've got bills to pay. I know you got troubles surmounting. I know life is difficult. But watch that little bird. He's not ringing his wings. He's not worried. He's singing his song, enjoying life. Doesn't even know who God is. He said, but you know there's a God in heaven that'll take care of you. And then he walked a little bit further and said, wait a minute, there's some lilies there. He said, see those lilies? Those lilies are popping up out of the, 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 the arid soil. And he said, they're the birds of the air. That means they belong to no one. They're the lilies of the field. That means they have no cultivator. There's no one taking care of them, and yet they're growing just fine. He said, those lilies are blue. You see those lilies there with that vibrant green green stem and those, those beautiful golden petals. And you, you see them there. Those lilies rise up in the morning and find fresh dew from another world every morning. They put their stem up to the sky. And don't you know there's oxygen for them to bring in? Hey, those lilies are growing there. And there's nutrients in the soil. They never one time bent their knee and begged for rain. They never one time prayed for nutrients in the soil. They never went and said, we'd like a beautiful golden robe to wrap ourselves in. Yet God is so good to consider the lilies that God would clothe that flower and provide their every need. And they don't toil. They don't spin. They didn't plow the soil. They didn't even sow the seed. They're just there by the grace of God. He said, but how much more you who he created in his own image, you whose name is written in his book of life, you whose son he's going to die for on the cross. He said, if he cares for those birds and he cares for those lilies, don't you think our Heavenly Father will care for you too? Boy, I'm glad for that truth tonight. I know it's hard living and easy preaching, but it's true nonetheless. I wished I could give you an example where God failed, but here's what I found out. He's never fallen short. God doesn't need you to stick your hand in what his hand is on. What God's hand is on, keep your hand out of. And there might be some things that are our responsibility, but listen, in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. That's God's responsibility. I'll give you a personal illustration. I'll close in just a minute. No, nobody here knows this except for my wife. Whenever we came, whenever we were moving here, I had one weight, one anchor, and it was a heavy one. Everything worked out so smoothly on our end and for the most part, on, on this end, I think everything worked out real smooth. Had, I don't know how many, seriously, over 100 preachers at least, call me or to everybody positive, excited, glad that I'm back out of Egypt and in Canaan land. <laughs> Man, I was shouting. We, were, we left. I flew Desiree and Link here on that Monday. And my brother and I began to drive. And I just listened to preaching and rejoiced and took phone calls, booked meetings. I mean, it was awesome. Yeah. Seven camp meeting in the car. We had lived in a townhouse in California. Now listen to me. My monthly rent, and I'll just tell you, you know, it wasn't my income. The church paid my house. But my monthly rent was $4,500 a month. $4,500 a month, not including the bills. 
And it was a townhouse, not a house. The whole state is like that. That's why you ought not vote Democrat. Anyway, anyhow, uh, uh, anyway. So I had my lease wasn't up till next July. I just re-signed it. And the clause in that lease was you can't just get out of it. You have to find somebody to rent it. And if nobody rents it, then you continue to pay it till the end of your lease term. The last Sunday of our realtor being in town before he took a two-week vacation, he showed it to a lady. And we'd been praying about it anyway, but that lady came in there, liked it. She said, I'm going to take it. He came to church Sunday night smiling at me. I said, what? He said, I got you somebody for your house. I said, man, if we were in front of everybody, I'd kiss you from the mouth right now. He said, <laughs> I said, man, I'm excited. He said, it's a blessing. He said, you're going to get your last month's rent back. He said, you're not going to have to pay. He said, it's, a, it's God works it out, man. I shot my victory. I was up on the platform that night. I was going to preach that. And I was, God is so good. Just so, super spiritual because yeah, yeah. of how good God was. Right. I was driving here. Landon called me on. Maybe that's the reason, Landon. Bad luck. Anyway, Landon called me on Tuesday, I think it was. And I was somewhere in, in the middle of, uh, of, of Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, it, we'll just say it called hell. Anyway, that's where I was at. Amarillo. Is, that's where I was at. I got a text message from my realtor with a sad face emoji, and that's never good. Oh. And then a paragraph after it apologizing, saying, I'm so sorry. She backed out. I never did tell you. I didn't tell anybody except my wife. I said, what are we going to do? He said, I don't, I don't know. He said, you only, have, you only have, see, I paid through August. He said, if we don't get something in there by September, he said, you got $4,500. I said, I don't have that anymore. The church was providing it for me. I don't have it. I said, you have to sue me. I don't even know how to pay it. Nobody looking at this house. Nobody. And then it was Friday after I left lunch with you fellas I missed the call from him got in my car called him back he said I don't know how to tell you this he said but somebody came in out of the blue yeah. and they took the house out of the blue. he said and you're going to get your last month's rent back. Right. Yeah. but I'll promise you this and I'm not that spiritual yeah. that little neighborhood where we're staying right now I don't know how many miles I've walked yeah. praying about that and I'd pray at dinner, <clears throat> and Lincoln didn't know, but I'd say, God, we got that one anchor. I wish you'd cut us loose from that one thing. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you, I lost sleep over it. Sure. I'd wake up in the middle of the night. Sure. And now I'm looking back on it and saying, that was dumb. What's the use of me being awake if God's awake? <laughs> I mean, if one of us is going to be awake, I'd rather it be him. And he came through. Now, here's what I know. God does not always come through on my time. God, God, doesn't, God doesn't get in a hurry. God doesn't get in a hurry. But God always comes through on time. And here's the thing, and I'll close. I won't preach the rest of this so we can go fellowship. Seek ye first. The priority of that is this. He said, you need money? Then you ought not be chasing money. If money is what you need, you ought to be chasing God. He said, you have a health problem, then you ought not be seeking healing. Don't seek healing. That's fine to ask for it. But seek God. You got family troubles? Well, then don't seek resolution. You'll drive yourself crazy. You can't control other people. But you can seek God. And if one of us is going to lose sleep, God says, let it be me. Don't you worry. Tonight, listen. Why should I be discouraged? Why should the shadows come? His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches you and me. And tonight, whatever, whatever's got you bogged down, God can. God can take care of that. And I just want to encourage you tonight and remind you, God is real good, real good at being God. He don't need help. He doesn't, need a, he doesn't need a little booster chair next to his throne for me to sit on. He's done it well since time and eternity, and he's not going to start messing up tonight. Don't worry.
Let's bow our heads for a little bit tonight. We'll have a time. If God spoke to your heart and you need to come speak to him, then you just come. I don't know what it is, but worry is just as much a sin as any other sin. And I tell you, it's probably the most prevalent sin in my life. And I hate to say that, but it's true. We just worry. I don't know why I worry. God's never failed me, ever, never failed me. I'm going to pray. If you want to come, you come. Lord, I pray that you bless this invitation tonight. Thank you for the privilege we've had to be in church. What a good day from the morning all the way through this evening. I pray you'd bless in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar is open. If you want to come spend some time in prayer tonight, you do.